Well, greetings and salutations, Series 7 test takers. This is the Series 7 Guru, and I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, This is Episode 4 of our continuing podcast series on the Series 7. Uh, We are doing it in order of how many performance opportunities, that's what I call test questions, are found in the actual exam. So right now, we're in function three. This is 91 questions on the exam. Uh, Our previous episode was equity securities. Uh, This episode is going to be mutual funds. Uh, We did a balance sheet. Balance sheet was the least testable of the, so far, the episodes we're working our way through in uh, section, our function three, which is investments, which kind of makes sense. And so today's episode is episode four, equity mutual funds. Now, uh, we're going to talk more uh, more uh, than just mutual funds. We're also going to talk about other packaged products. That would be ETFs, ETNs, uh, REITs, partnerships. This whole category of the exam is called packaged products. Uh, mutual funds are uh, high probability, lots of test questions. You can easily see 20 questions on mutual funds. The three biggest areas of this function, three investments, is options, munis, and uh, mutual funds, and we will be doing uh, options will be episode uh, five. Now, one of the things that's very testable on this series seven is to be able to contrast an open end versus a closed end fund. You know, the test is all about compare and contrast. How are things, how are investments alike, investment vehicles, and how are they different? It's much more testable to know how investment vehicles differ. The major difference here that gets tested is open-end funds are continually offering new shares to the public. And that means not only are you subject to the Investment Company Act of 1940, you're also subject to 33, right? Because 33 says you're going to sell brand new securities to the public. That's what a mutual fund is doing. You're going to have to make a registration statement. You're going to have to give people prospectuses so they can make informed decisions, right? So that's uh, going to be the open. And now closed-end funds closed to additional investors. That's what it means, closed. So once they do their initial public offering or their primary transactions, then closed-end funds, very testable, trade in the secondary market, supply and demand, right? So that's a very testable distinction. How are open-end funds and closed-end funds different? I'll link to a full-blown lecture on mutual funds, uh, a tutoring replay, two uh, tutoring replays on mutual funds, part one, part two. Uh, No surprise, I'll put it in the video description. I'll also put it in the pinned comment. And uh, no surprise, I think you should watch it. It has a whole slide that goes over those distinctions. There's others, but those are the big ones. The types of uh, mutual funds we have. You know, I always joke, if you do pass your Series 7, I know you will, you go back to your manager and say, I know I have full registration. I know I have a Series 7 but would it be okay if I just sell mutual funds? Most supervisor would say, boy, that would be wonderful, right? Because, you know, the mutual fund is the investment vehicle that gets people to where they're going financially more often than not without crashing and burning. Because a mutual fund provides a client with professional management, diversification, and the ease of ownership. You know, when I ask a client, do you have the time, temperament, expertise to be managing money? You know, the vast majority of people are going to say they don't have the time, the temperament, or expertise to be managing money. I then say to the retail investor, well, then you should avail yourself of professional management. And they say, man, I can avail myself of a professional money manager for as little as $500? Who knows, there might be mutual ones even less than that. I say, yes, there are men and women who have sold their soul to manage that $500 for you. Now, what we're trying to do is find a mutual fund that has the same investment objective or similar to that of the customer. I kind of joke, it's kind of like a tender for mutual funds, right? Are we going to swap right? Are we going to swap left, right? And so in equity securities, uh, equity fund, for the most part, the name of the fund kind of gives it away what kind of fund it is, right? So if it's an equity fund, it's invested in equities stocks. And, you know, why would you buy stocks? Why would you want to buy a stock portfolio? Because what you're buying, by the way, is proportion ownership in a portfolio of equity securities. We refer to these types of investments as pooled investments, right? Because 
it's a pool and you own a portion of that. And again, uh, you would have diversification. So that's the neat thing. You know, if there were 10 equally suitable equity securities to buy, common stocks, I picked one of the 10. The other nine did fine. The one I picked went under. That's called selection risk. Also known as on systematic risk. And very testable, the easiest way to avoid that is to diversify. And the easiest way to diversify is in a mutual fund. Now, we don't uh, get rid of what's called systematic risk. Though risk will prevail despite our diversification here. If we're in, my, in an equity fund and the stock market's doing poorly, so will the NAV of my uh, equity mutual fund most likely. There is a tendency of securities prices to move together. So test point, in a mutual fund, an equity mutual fund, we avoid selection on systematic risk, but we do not avoid systematic risk risks in the system. Uh, we have fixed income mutual funds. Now, this is the one time the mutual fund can actually be more dangerous than the individual securities. You know, what I mean by that is if I own individual bonds in my bond portfolio and interest rates go up and the bonds uh, go down, I could choose to hold them to maturity. I'd be immune from that volatility of interest rates, that inverse relationship of interest rates and bond prices. But in a mutual fund, that would not be true, right? A mutual fund interest rates go up, the value of the bonds of the portfolio go down. And that's important to understand that. Again, the bond portfolio has systematic risk. It doesn't matter what bonds are there. Now you do avoid credit risk. Remember the two risks associated with debt denominated securities, fixed income investment vehicles, what we mean here is bonds, is uh, credit risk and interest rate risk. Oh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Anyways, the two risks we have are credit risk and interest rate risk. And we avoid credit risk. It's unlikely that every bond I buy in the portfolio is going to go, uh, you know, going to default. Right. So why would I want to buy, for example, one less than investment grade bond, one high yield bond, when I could buy a high yield bond fund and get that diversification of the credit risk? But regardless of what kind of bond fund I have, I have not avoided uh, interest rate risk. Money market funds, very testable. You know, we always ask the client, what would you like to do with your idle uh, monies? Do you want to put it in a traditional bank account? We have that available. Or would you like to put it in a money market mutual fund? And it's very testable to know the types of money market instruments that would be found in a money market fund. Right? So you need to know about bankers acceptances would be found in a money market fund. Bankers acceptances test question are used to facilitate foreign trade. They're issued at a discount. They have a max maturity of 270 days. You need to know about commercial paper, large unsecured borrowing by corporations. Again, issued at a discount, 270 day max maturity. You need to know about T-bills. And T-bills, you don't have credit risk because it's got, you know, full faith and credit of the United States Treasury. And you also don't have interest rate risk because whatever interest rates are doing, that's what the D-bills. And those would be instruments that would be found in a money market uh, uh, fund. One more, negotiable jumbo CDs. Negotiable means that there is a secondary market for the CD, which makes sense because if I'm a money market fund manager, I have to be able to meet redemption requests. And so a negotiable jumbo CD means there I can sell it to a third party. And then jumbo means $100,000 or more. You know, if you just go into the bank and get a, a CD, you know, as a retail customer, the CD is typically non-negotiable, meaning you can't, you know, assign it to a third party. Well, we're always doing business uh, based on a calculation of the net asset value. You know, under the Investment Company Act of 1940, a mutual fund is required to calculate its NAV once per business day. You know, and they're going to take the assets, that's the securities in the portfolio, minus the liabilities. And that gets net asset value. And then we divide by number of shares, we get NAV per share. We're going to do that once per business day. Now in the NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. And we're always doing business based on that next calculation of the NAV. It is very testable to know that the maximum sales charge is eight and a half percent. So NAV, I'll just make up a number, $9.15. Sales charge, $0.85. Cents. Public offering price is 10 If I take 0.85, $0.85 cents sales charge, 
I divide by 10, that's the legal limit of 8.5%. And so I would know uh, that's what that's going to look like. NAV plus sales charge equals the public offering price. Now, you might end up qualifying for a lowered uh, uh, sales charge. You know, we have what are called breakpoints as applies to mutual funds. And then very testable know that we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. So you say, Dana, I want to invest $20,000. How many shares am I going to get? I said, well, I don't know until we do the next calculation of the NAV. You say, uh, Dean, I want to redeem. Uh, how, many, how much money am I going to get? I said, I don't know until we do the next calculation of the NAV. Very testable. That is called forward pricing. Now, we uh, have what are called no-load funds. A no-load fund would be NAV, in my example, $9.15, plus zero, zero sales charge, $9.15. So, you know, if we see a mutual fund on the test that has an NAV and the pop that are the same, that either is a closed-end fund that coincidentally is just trading in the secondary market at the NAV, or more likely, it's a no-load fund. Right, so those are uh, no low funds. We have various uh, share classes, and the traditional uh, share class is an A share. A shares have a front end load, and A shares test question suitability are best for investors who have a large amount to invest. The point being, they might qualify for a quantity discount and a long term time horizon. And the A share is typically the traditional kind of share class. A lot of mutual funds are getting rid of B shares and C shares because it's just too confusing, right? But we also have uh, B shares. Now, the B share have a contingent deferred sales charge. And there's a couple of test questions here about the B shares. One test question is, we are not supposed to misuse no load terminology. You know, whether it's a front end load or a back end load, a contingent deferred sales charge needs to be described as such. You know, here this would be appropriate test question for somebody who has a smaller amount to invest and a long-term time horizon because typically in a back-end fund, a contingent deferred sales load B share, five to seven years, you know, there's a declining kind of a sales charge, it uh, becomes an A share. And so that would be important to know. I kind of think of it as like I'm going into a nightclub. This is misuse of no, ter no load terminology. And uh, they say, hey, Dean, there's no cover charge and there's free valet parking. I go, well, wonderful. <laughs> you know? I go in, I have uh, some bottle service. I come back and they say, Dean, there's a $40 exit fee. And I say, well, I thought you told me there was no cover charge. And they say, well, Dean, there is no cover charge, but there is an exit fee. You know, but if you go back in there and get another bottle, we'll, we'll waive that. Now, the point is they should have disclosed to me. Hey, Dean, you know, there is no cover charge or and there's free valet parking as long as you order three bottles or, you know, if you order two of the three, you know, you're going to pay something, you know, that needs to be disclosed in advance. So the two test questions about contingent deferred sales charges in B shares is misuse of no load terminology and then understanding this would be suitable for somebody who has a smaller amount to invest and has a long term time horizon. Now, I always joke, there is a problem with having monkeys harvest bananas. And the problem with having monkeys harvest bananas is they eat the product. You know, and the product here is money. And the single largest expense to a mutual fund. Be careful what you're being asked. You know, my mantra is RTFQ. Read the full question. Make sure you're clear what you're being asked. The largest single expense to a mutual fund is the management fee. Now, every once in a while, I say, well, what about the load, that 8.5%? Be careful. The load is not paid by the mutual fund. That 8.5% load is paid by the client. So be careful what you're being asked. Now, there are, could be other fees that aren't associated with managing the money. And you do get tested on 12B1 fees. Those are promotional or marketing expenses. You know, it's an ongoing fee to market the fund, to promote the fund. And there's two numbers you should be aware of as it relates to 12B1 fees. One is the maximum promotional expense 
that a no load fund can charge and still refer to themselves or hold themselves out to the public as a no load fund. And that would be 0.25 would be the number. Put that up there for you. The other one to be aware of is over the life, I can't charge more than 0.75. So the point is if I go past 0.25, I can no longer refer to myself as a no load fund. And in no circumstance over the life of the fund could I charge more than three quarters of 1%. Now, when I was a baby broker decades ago, I sold a lot of the Franklin funds. And I don't know if it's still true today, but when I was a broker, uh, you know, I started out as a retail broker, ended up as an institutional kind of broker, but uh, I would sell the Franklin funds, the load was 4%. So, you know, if you invest uh, $50,000, uh, 2,000 is the load, 48,000 goes into the fund at the uh, next calculation of the NAV. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I'm charging three quarters of 1%, the idea here is that, you know, might've been better to pay me 4% and be done with me than paying me three quarters of 1% forever, right? So what is it, the fourth year or the fifth year or sixth year, it would be uh, better, the client would be better served, it would be in their best interest perhaps to buy the A share. And so the idea on the test is that 12B1 fees are not going to be good for a long-term investor because again, over the long-term, uh, you know, more money is gonna get eaten up uh, in this. All right, so uh, the number one way that people get where they're going, as I mentioned, is usually in a mutual fund. And what we're always looking for is an opportunity to do dollar cost averaging. Now, there are three test questions about dollar cost averaging. Test question number one is what makes it work? What makes it work is if I can get a customer to give me fixed dollars invested regularly. You'll do that, you'll have a built-in savings discipline and an investment discipline because you'll be doing exactly what you should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. That's exactly what you should be doing. Test question number two, you will end up with a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. Terrific, right? Terrific. And then test question number three is we can't guarantee a profit. Now, outside of Series 7 fantasy land, you know, good news, you guys pass your Series 7. You get to leave the Series 7 fantasy land. I'm stuck here permanently. No wonder I'm demented. I never get to leave. But outside of Series 7 fantasy land, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that somebody who's do, do, doing dollar cost averaging over the long term uh, is not going to do well, particularly if you think there's an upward bias to the economy. However, you know, uh, I'm supposed to have a client that doesn't guarantee profit. If you uh, look at that lecture, I think I have an example where somebody actually does dollar cost average and they end up uh, at that point, we're doing the average cost. They end up having a lower average cost, the underlying shares test question, but they're still, they have still have lost money. Uh, computing the sales charge. The way we compute the sales charge as a percentage is we take the public offering price minus the NAV. In my example, the public offering price was 10. We subtract the NAV, that's 85 cents. We take the 85 cents, we divide by uh, the public offering price and that will give us the calculation of the percentage sales charge. There's two things that you should be able to do. Uh, and I have a great uh, example in a recent video where I did this. The two mathematical things you should be able to do in a mutual fund is when given the NAV and the public offering price, calculate the percentage sales charge. The second thing you should be able to do is when given the NAV and the percentage sales charge, calculate the public offering price. So I say to you, hey, listen, uh, good news for you, this mutual fund has a break point. So, you know, eight and a half percent is, uh, you know, going to pay $10, 915 plus 85 cents, $10. But if you invest $50,000 or more, you don't pay an 8.5% load, you pay a 6.5% load. This mutual fund has a break point at uh, $50,000. And that would be the second scenario. You know, you say, well, Dean, if I qualify the reduced sales charge of 6.5%, I wouldn't be paying 10. And so now what I do is I take the NAV, $9.15. I divide by 100% minus the sales charge in this example. 
uh, what is that, six and a half percent? So I would take a 915 divide by 9.935. I think that comes out to $9.78, which is a much better deal to be able to pay a, a lower load, right? And so it'd be important to tell them how to get that reduced sales charge. So breakpoints are very testable. It's a quantity discount is a good thing. And you say, well, Dean, uh, how much should I invest to get the, I know you told me 50,000 is uh, six and a half percent. How much should I invest? I say, you want to invest $49,999. So I can make eight and a half percent instead of six and a half percent. And very testable. That would be called a breakpoint sale, and that would be a big no-no, right? That is a violation of the code of conduct. And so, you know, a big no-no. So you say, even if, by the way, the easy way to stay out of trouble is to tell people how to get the breakpoint. So maybe in my example, you say, hey, Dean, I have $40,000. I say, do you think over the next 13 months you might be able to come up with another $10,000? Because if so, test question, we shouldn't sign a letter of intent. A letter of intent, test question is good for 13 months. And if you sign it, you'll get the reduced sales charge up front. You say, ah, oh, man, Dean, there's no way I'm coming up with the 13, uh, you know, the other 10 grand. I say, okay, well, it is what it is. Uh, you say, uh, call me two months later and you say, damn, I should have done it. I just came into some money. I say, well, good news, the uh, letter of intent can be backdated 90 days. So very testable. It's good for 13 months and can be backdated 90 days. That 90 days is inclusive of, is inclusive of uh, the 13 months. What I mean by that is if you uh, wait 90 days, you only have 10 months left to, to do that. Now it is testable to know who does not qualify for break points. In other words, we will allow a husband and wife to pull their purchases. You know, we'll allow you to pull your purchases, you know, for your kids up month, you know, but the point is investment clubs, test question, are not allowed to pull their purchases for purposes of uh, meeting a break point. So uh, break, point sale, break points are good, break point sales are bad. You know, uh, one of the disadvantages of a mutual fund is you give up tax control of your investments. You know, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. And the easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. You know, and if we didn't have subchapter M, or the conduit or pipeline theory of taxation. What would happen is the company, the corporation, would pay taxes, pay a dividend to the mutual fund that owns the corporation's stock, the mutual fund would pay taxes, and then distribute that dividend to me and I would pay taxes, my God. The money would get taxed three times. The IRS has been kind enough to say that as long as a mutual fund test question and REITs, as for mutual funds and REITs. You buy a REIT for the same reason that you buy a mutual fund. You buy a REIT for professional management, diversification, ease of ownership, but it's not a portfolio of securities, rather it's a portfolio of real estate investments. But same basic idea. And both REITs and mutual funds have to pass that through. I think a good way to remember it is die 90. 90% of their net investment income. That means 90% of the dividends the mutual fund receives on the stocks, plus the interest the mutual fund receives on the bonds on the portfolio, minus the expenses, 90%. It's a recognition question. I'm not gonna make you do any kind of calculation based on this, but most mutual funds do substantially better. Now, as I said, uh, I might tell the mutual fund that I don't need those dividends, and I might tell the mutual funds, I don't need the capital gains distributions. So just buy me additional fund shares. So I tell the mutual fund to reinvest the dividends in capital gains. These are called DRIPs, very testable. A DRIP is a dividend reinvestment program. And the test question about a dividend reinvestment program is assuming the mutual fund is in my retirement plan. If I'm reinvesting those dividends, that's going to be taxable. You know, and the capital gains distributions to me will be taxable. As I mentioned, when I was a baby broker, I sold a lot of the Franklin, particularly the tax-free funds. You know, the Franklin, California tax-free fund was kind of my go-to kind of uh, way to meet people. Are you interested in tax-free income? 
And what we're saying here is in the Franklin, California tax-free fund, the dividends represent the tax-free return on the munis. But if the portfolio manager sells that and then, you know, buys the uh, more, you know, buy, I tell them to buy more stuff, more shares, that's going to be taxable. So I wouldn't owe taxes on the dividends there because it's a muni bond fund. But if it was a stock fund and I'm receiving the pass-through or a bond fund, the pass-through, the interest is going to be dividends. The drip is going to be uh, testable, testable and taxable. Oh, I love that. Testable and taxable. <laughs> you know? um, uh, the IRS calls that constructive receipt, constructive receipt. All right. So we're talking about in uh, this episode, uh, packaged products, usually 20 plus questions. And, you know, uh, these are flyovers in the podcast series. As I said, I will link uh, in the video description and in a pinned comment to an entire mutual fund lecture. But as I said, uh, on the test in general, you always have to compare and contrast investment vehicles. How are investment vehicles similar and how are they different? Now, how are open and enclosed funds, how are they different? So the contrasting differences are more testable than how they're alike. And there are things that mutual uh, people don't like about mutual funds. And so what you have to be able to do on the test is contrast a traditional open-end mutual fund with an exchange-traded fund. How are they alike? How are they different? You know, what are the advantages of an ETF over a traditional open-end mutual fund? Well, uh, 34, the 34 Act, gave the control of credit extension from broker-dealers to customers to the Federal Reserve Board. And the Federal Reserve Board says that we can't extend credit on new issues. It's considered a new issue 30 days from the effective date. And remember, in an open-end fund, every share is a new share. So you can't buy an open-end mutual fund on margin. You know, uh, we said some people don't like forward pricing. You know, for this idea that you're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. You know, people don't like this idea of active management because active management has a higher cost structure it has lower tax efficiency. So what you have to be able to do is contrast that traditional open-end mutual fund with an exchange-traded fund, which trades like a stock, supply and demand, so no forward pricing. How is it different than an open-end mutual, traditional open-end mutual fund? What I mean by traditional is we, we classify these as, as open-end mutual funds, but for test purposes, I'm trying to contrast the tried and true plain vanilla traditional open-end fund with this ETF. Right, and that's that's one testable distinction. Another testable distinction is you can buy ETFs on margin and you can sell them short. You can't do that with an open-end mutual fund. And since for test purposes, they're passively managed, that means they have a lower cost structure and that means they are more tax efficient than would be a traditional open-end mutual fund. Uh, UIT is very testable. Again, it's a low probability question, but it's certainly there. And so here, what you need to know about a unit investment trust is it has a fixed portfolio and passive management. So the assets have been professionally selected. So I say this is the Nuveen uh, California Tax-Free Unit Investment Trust. These muni bonds have been professionally selected. However, this portfolio is not going to be actively managed. Now, again, as the bonds pay interest, that'll be passed through to UIT holders like yourself. And as the bonds mature or redeemed, that will be passed through to the UIT as, uh, holders like yourself as well. So fixed portfolio, passive management. Now, in variable annuities, in variable annuities, uh, you'd be doing yourself a great service if every time you heard the word variable annuity, you say mutual fund with an insurance wrapper, mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. And in a variable annuity, we sometimes refer to this as a non-qualified retirement plan. Now in a fixed annuity, not a securities product, in a fixed annuity, your money would go into the general account of the insurance company and they would invest that and hope to pay you, make more than they're paying you in that fixed annuity. That's a traditional kind of an insurance product. But here, your money is not going into the general account of the insurance company. In a variable annuity, it's going into the separate account, a mutual fund. Intellectually, saying you have 6,000 accumulation units in a separate account is no different than saying you have 6,000 shares in a mutual fund. It's just that the language has changed a little bit. 
And you can expect a couple of questions in this area on variable annuities. Uh, Non-qualified, what that means is you are using money to fund this that you've already paid taxes on. So if I put $100,000 into variable annuity, that's going to be my cost basis. Cost basis is simply when you turn the money into the investment. And so that's $100,000, and that's going to buy me accumulation units in the separate account. Now, unlike a regular mutual fund, remember we talked earlier that if I, even if I say I don't need the dividends or capital gains, reinvest them, it was taxable. But here I don't have access to the reinvestment of the dividends and capital gains distributions. I must reinvest into the separate account. And since I must reinvest and I have no constructive receipt, the money is going to grow tax deferred. And when I'm 59 and a half, maybe I got a million dollars, let's say, right? So I put a hundred thousand dollars in when I'm, you know, 30 years old. Now I have a million dollars. Um, you shouldn't fund these unless you have everything else taken care of on the qualified front. You know, you should max out all of the retirement plans you have available to you where you get to use pre-tax money before you even consider a variable annuity being an, uh, 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 a recommendation. Now, when I'm 59 and a half, I can choose to either get a lump sum distribution. In other words, I say, hey, send me the million dollars. And uh, it's good $900,000 is what I owe taxes on because remember the 100 I already paid taxes on. So $900,000 is going to be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. You know, uh, you say, well, Jason, you never told me that. I go, well, I should have. <laughs> I mean, you should know that going in. It's not going to be a long-term capital gain. Let's say I want to do a random distribution. I said, well, no, okay, don't send me the entire million. Just send me the 100 I put in there originally. Eh. Test question, last money's in, our first money's out. So in my example, if I take 100, it's going to be 100 of the 900 I've never I've paid taxes on. The other thing I can do that's pretty cool is I can annuitize and turn it into an income stream that I can't outlive. Pretty cool. You know, and I could do uh, life only. I could do life and joint survivor. I could do a lot of different uh, payout options. But life only would give me the largest monthly check. The largest monthly check. And once I annuitize, we're going to turn the accumulation units into annuity units. And I say, hey, listen, uh, when you get your first check, give me a call. And you say, hey, Dean, uh, I annuitized. I got my first check. It's $1,000. I said, okay, well, the reason I want you to call me is, you know, that monthly check is going to go up or down based on the assumed interest rate, the air. So next month's check is either going to be more than $1,000, uh, less than $1,000 or $1,000. And so why don't you call me until, you know, we get this, uh, you know, where you understand it. And you say, what's the assumed interest rate? I said, well, I don't want to tell you because it would just confuse you, right? But, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. We will be an insurance coming along if we don't do this correctly. But let's say I tell you it's 4%. Next month, you get a check for 1,010. That means we got more than the 4%. I mean, it doesn't matter how much more. Don't get hung up on, you know, whether it's 20% or, you know, 5%. doesn't matter. If it's more than four, check goes up if that's the year. If we get four, you call me and you say, hey, Dean, I got another 1,010. Third check was the same as the previous check. That means we got the assumed interest rate. You call me the next month, I got a thousand, went down again. That means we did less than four. It doesn't matter, by the way, if it's three, three is still positive performance. It doesn't matter. It's just a comparison to the assumed interest rate. Again, this is the law of large numbers or averages, which uh, insurance companies and actuaries are experts on. So it's not our job to kind of do the math. It's our job to kind of explain it to the customer. Now, in terms of that check you're getting, Remember, you invested $100,000, now you have a million. And so uh, of the check you get each month, 90% is going to be taxable. 10% is return of the money you already paid taxes. That's your exclusion ratio, the money you're not paying taxes on. All right, and I'll tell you what I will do. I'll link on a variable annuity in the video description as well as in the pinned comments. So now you'll have a full lecture on mutual funds, two of them, part one, part two. You'll have a full lecture on uh, variable annuities. Uh, REITs we talked about already in terms of packaged products. And the last thing we want to talk about in this episode is direct participation programs, also known as partnerships. I'll start by saying almost every vendor goes total overkill 
on partnerships, direct participation programs, as it relates to the actual Series 7. There are two areas where I think vendors really miss the mark in terms of giving you way more information than necessary. By the way, all vendors. And those two areas are margin and partnerships. In margin, three, four questions, partnerships, two, three questions, your time is better spent elsewhere. Please note, I didn't say there's not margin questions. I didn't say there's not partnership questions. I'm saying they're just not going to be as difficult as vendors make it out to. Now, in a partnership, there's going to be a general partner who provides the management expertise. And that general partner has unlimited liability. And the limited partners are going to provide the money. Now, in partnerships have a complete pass-through of the income and the losses right? A pass-through. There is no retained earnings like there is in a corporation. You know, the Golden State Warriors is a partnership. The general partner is Joe Lakeup. The limited partners have put up money. They're not involved in the day-to-day management of the Golden State Warriors. If the Golden State Warriors make money, that will be passed through. The, the reporting form, who cares, is called a K-1. And if they lose money, that loss will be passed through. Now, the only thing you can do with passive losses and passive income is match them up. You can't take those anywhere else in your in your tax return. Now, as you recall, on taxation of portfolio under income, you can take up to three, but not here. Whatever happens in partnerships stays in partnerships. Um, I don't know. We're trying to do a flyover here. We're trying to keep these in about 30 minutes. You let me know if you made it to this point and you want me to link a partnership lecture uh, that would do it. So we got a, about a 30 minute video with uh, supporting videos that are four or five hours worth, right? The vast majority of the uh, test questions on direct participation programs are going to be on the various types available. You know, I can't imagine that you don't get tested on limited partnerships or partnerships in general having a lack of liquidity. You know, lack of liquidity because you can't get in or out of a partnership without the general partner's permission. So suitability, right? And then types would be, I can't imagine where you don't get asked about an oil and gas exploratory program, wildcat program, being the most, uh, you know, aggressive, uh, the most risky oil and gas programs we have. I mean, I didn't say an oil and gas income pr program where we've proven producing reserves is not risky. I just said as oil and gas partnerships go, uh, you know, the wildcat exploratory program would be that. We have real estate limited partnerships. Uh, we have equipment leasing partnerships with their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I would know that we could form a partnership where we could get some tax credits, a dollar for dollar whack out of our tax bill for historic real estate and low income housing. And the partnerships will either be offered on a private basis. You know, partnerships can be sold as a private placement. A Reg D, Remember Exempt Transaction, if it's a private placement, then we can only sell this partnership to accredited investors and institutional investors. Or it could be a partnership that we organize and distribute to the public. If it's a public offering, remember that's going to be different. Then we can sell it to anybody, but we're going to have to make uh, more disclosures. Okay, so I hope you found uh, these uh, podcast episodes uh, helpful. Our, our next episode is Options, uh, Episode 5. Eh, you know, again, these uh, podcasts are a little difficult because we don't have whiteboards and you know, we're figuring you're driving in the car, you're, you know, you're at the gym and you're, you're listening to the audio. Maybe you're watching the uh, video feed, but who knows? Uh, remember, they're also available on Spotify. And uh, that's going to be a real challenge as it relates to our options. We're probably going to primarily go over a vocabulary, nomenclature, again, the things you should be aware of, kind of give you a heads up on that, right? So that will be our, our game plan. So Remember, uh, inch by inch, your Series 7 is a cinch. Yard by yard, your Series 7 is hard. And I'll see you for Episode 5, uh, Options. Bye-bye.